What happens when you heat water? That's what we're going to talk about. Now, we're going to talk about uh, largely heating temperature changes. So we're going to talk about kinetic energy changes for the most part. And uh, let's see. So I've got a hot plate. And on top of that, I place a kettle. Excuse my kettle drawing here. There's the handle for the kettle. Here's the spout. So eventually steam will be coming out of the spout. And this is a kettle with a spout. Many of my drawings have to have labels as to what they are, otherwise it would be unclear. Uh, inside this kettle is some water. And let's try and understand what's happening here. So let's just say the hot plate gets electricity. So it's plugged into the wall. And it turns out that electricity, the positioning of the positive and negative charges, say in a battery, but also in your wall, the electricity with its potential energy moves charges. Those moving charges are then converted into the heat in your hot plate. So potential energy from electricity is converted into kinetic energy to heat up the hot plate. To warm up the hot plate. And we know that it's kinetic energy because the temperature is changing, okay? And we know that it's potential energy because we have charges and you could do it with your wall, but you could also do it with a battery. And batteries are storage places for, in which when you recharge your battery, they separate charges. When you use your battery, the charges come together and they use up that potential energy. Okay, so that was number one. Number two, so let's now talk about the hot plate. The hot plate is a solid. With higher temperature and more kinetic energy. Higher T and more kinetic energy. But it's a solid. The solid's not moving. So how does a solid have kinetic energy? If it's not moving. Well, each of the particles in the hot plate as it heats up. So let's see, uh, room temperature, hot plate, particles in that hot plate. High temperature particles in that hot plate. The particles vibrate. Faster at higher temperatures. At lower temperatures, they vibrate more slowly, but now you've got, so hot plate, you plug it in, you turn it on, all of a sudden those hot plate particles are vibrating because they're getting hotter. Next, we gotta think about how the water actually gets hotter from this. And the hot plate particles bump into the kettle particles.
kettle particles. And your hot plate may be made out of ceramic or metal, or you know, hot plates come in a lot of different forms. I put my hot plate away. Um, but kettles are usually metal. Okay, so uh, here's the kettle particle, which is at room temperature. Here's the hot plate particle, which is hot. All of a sudden, it bumps into this, and then it transfers some of that very fast vibrational energy, and then the kettle is hot. So uh, let's put, that's not a period, transferring its kinetic energy to kettle. So now the kettle's hot, right? So hot plate, I don't know if I can do this, kettle, they bump into each other, it's sitting right on it, and now the kettle is hot. Kettle is hot. Vibrating particles are vibrating fast particles. I don't know why that sounds almost like a haiku portion, but it's not good English and I apologize. The kettle is hot, vibrating fast particles. Well, there it is. All right, and then now the kettle's hot and here's the water and the water is a liquid, so it's moving around and then the water bumps into the kettle particles and gets some of that kinetic energy. Water bumps into kettle particles. Gets kinetic energy, heats up, heats up. Now the water's warm, and what's interesting too about the water, interesting to me and hopefully to you, is that since the water at the bottom is touching the kettle, which is the hot part, it then moves away, and colder water gets down there, and bumps into the kettle, and it heats up too. So you also have some motion of the water particles because the water can move in the kettle. But eventually, everything gets hot inside the water in the kettle, and it's hot enough to create gas. So let's do number five. So water gets hot enough Again, just by bumping, it's like a giant conga line of uh, vibrations that are being transferred from one object to another until all of, the vib all of the different things are hot. Water gets hot enough to boil, um, turn into a gas. And gases move extremely fast. They have a lot of kinetic energy. They're moving hundreds of meters per second, and that's why they very quickly exit the kettle and create the whistle if you have a whistling kettle. So my analogy here, a couple things we pick up from this picture, is that potential energy can be converted into kinetic energy. That, and that kinetic energy being energy of motion you start with something hot that vibrates, bumps into the next thing, makes the next thing hot, bumps into the water molecules, which makes them hot, bumps into them so much that they turn into a gas. And gases have, they're the highest temperature. They have the most kinetic energy, and they travel the fastest, and then they escape out the spout. Okay, so now... We know a little bit about that, and that's the energy of brewing because you have to heat up the water. Heating the other, so energy of roasting is about the same thing. You're going to have hot air for your roaster. It's going to be hitting the beans, right? You're, you're having that hot air go through all your beans enough to cause the beans to move. 
but then it the beans heat up and eventually they get so hot that they start popping and reacting um, because reactions occur at higher temperatures so it's the same idea now this is a problem that you're going to be asked to do and this is something that deals with the activity it says how much energy does it take to heat 25.0 grams of water from 22.4 degrees to 90 degrees Celsius. Assume that the specific heat capacity of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Let's, before we go dive into this question, let's talk about what the specific heat capacity of water is. First off, the specific heat capacity of water has the symbol, well, C sub S is specific heat capacity, and W, stands for water. So the specific heat capacity of water will be capital C, uh, lowercase s, comma w. That's its symbol. And it is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So that means if you want to heat, so uh, to heat one gram of water, one degrees Celsius, so say from 25 to 26 degrees Celsius, it takes 4.184 joules. So we're heating 25 grams by just shy of 70 degrees Celsius. So I just want to say it's going to take a lot, a lot of joules to do this. And water is one of the highest specific heat capacity materials that there is. It takes a lot of energy to heat up water. It is definitely related to the chemistry and the science of the shape of water molecules. Perhaps you've heard of something called hydrogen bonds. Yes, it's all in there. But this is a very high number. high number compared to almost all other things. There are a couple things that are higher, but not many. So it's very hard to heat up water. Just as much, it is very hard to cool down water. We are 70% water, roughly. We are hard to heat up and hard to cool down, which is good because if it was easy, our body temperature would change all the time. Instead, our body is working very hard to keep it, uh, to keep putting in energy and keep us warm. And um, yes, so the fact that our bodies are made out of water, water is very hard to heat up and cool down. It makes it hard for our body temperature change, though not impossible. Let's see. And for, again, just to think about in terms of energy, to do one gram, it takes four joules over four joules of energy and that is let me get my 18 quarters that would be dropping these from approximately four meters that potential energy is the energy to do one gram of water one degree celsius so point being it takes a lot of energy to heat up water let's find out how much this equation in our units i heart units is going to be that uh, I need to multiply this times the grams times the degrees Celsius to get the joules. The equation looks like this. So energy, which will equal E, is going to equal the mass in grams this time times the specific heat capacity of water times the temperature change of water. And let me write that out how you might more normally see it in a, a different science class. So M times C sub SW times, well, change in science is oftentimes represented by triangle which is the lowercase Greek letter delta.
capital, that should be capital G, Greek letter delta. So we're going to use delta T. Now another thing about temperature changes, and another thing, this is throughout science, temperature changes are always your final temperature, which will be T final, minus T initial, like so. Always, 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 final temperature minus initial temperature. I'm sure there's one or two exceptions out there, but everything I've seen in chemistry, physics, biology has final minus initial temperature. So now let's calculate this out. I've got my mass in grams, which is 25.0 grams. I've got my specific heat capacity of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And I've got my final temperature of 90.0 degrees minus my initial temperature of 22.4 degrees Celsius. And let's see, so 90 minus 22.4, let's do our subtraction first. I get 67.6, still with units of degrees Celsius. I'm going to multiply that times 4.184 times 25, and I get, is that right? I don't think that's right. Let's try that again. So 67.6 times 4.184. That's 282, oh yeah, that's right, times 25, 7,000, more than 7,000 joules. All right, I, wonder if, I don't think it'll do this, but I'm gonna do, yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to turn it into scientific notation myself. Uh, well, eh, 7,071 joules, or 7.07 .07 times 10 to the, one, two, three, three, joules. So over 7,000 joules just to heat up the water to make, uh, well, this isn't even enough to make a pot of water. We need about 300, or sorry, a cup of coffee. We need about 350 grams. So we're going to need much more energy. It takes a lot of energy to heat up water to make our average cup of coffee, that's for sure.